This is a practice run of hotspots, flops, and micro-ops, a session on x86 CPU optimization. The benefits from fast, efficient code are obvious. You want to do as much as you can with the available computing resources in order to make your 3D interactive application run faster and put more stuff in it. There's a lot of really good optimization advice out there already. Some examples are listed on the slide here. Now, I'm not going to go through all of them, but certainly following suggestions like these may improve your performance. Or, you may have to end up spending time modifying code without making any difference. Or, even worse, there are circumstances where any one of these tips will make everything backfire and slow down. So, it can be frustrating when optimization is just random trial and error guesswork. Therefore, it's better to know what is really going on underneath the hood so you know where to improve your code and how fast it can potentially be. And this brings us to the agenda of today's talk. We're taking a look under the hood and uncovering what is really going on. For the first half, we're going to explore the architecture to see how the code actually gets executed, explore some of the CPU features, in particular AVX, a new SIMD instruction set architecture, and of course, how do we actually write code to reach optimal performance? Don't worry, no assembly required. And later, the second half, we're going to take a performance tuning walkthrough to show how you can apply these godlike optimizations to your own monstrous code base even when you don't have a clue what's going on or even where to begin. Okay, let's get started. When writing code, developers focus on their features and algorithms and tend to think of the CPU as a simple black box that processes one instruction then the next instruction, and so on. Each instruction, you know, loading some data, operating on some registers, and maybe writing some results back to memory. Well, the x86 is not your grandfather's CPU. There's a lot more going on under the hood. There's a lot of technology behind the modern microprocessor. Although you may not care so much about the distance between NAND gates or how much current the chip draws, However, from a performance perspective, there are some key architectural differences to be aware of because they greatly affect programming. For example, caches. Well, you may already be familiar with caches and how they influence performance. To recap, if a CPU instruction addresses data that it hasn't touched in a while, it's probably sitting out in main memory and therefore it takes longer to load than had that data been used recently and still happens to be sitting in a closer data cache. So how does this knowledge help us write faster code? Well, it is often beneficial to structure your algorithm to maximize the work done on localized chunks of data and then move on to the next chunk of data and so on. Similarly, it's often faster to use arrays instead of linked lists because the hardware can see what you're doing and prefetch data ahead of time so it's sitting there in cache before you actually start using it. The next architectural feature worth noting is the branch prediction unit. This unit speculatively submits instructions for execution even before it is certain it has the correct code path. The results from any bad predictions are simply thrown away, but successfully predicted branches will end up delivering results sooner than they would have otherwise. Therefore, it's in a, pro it's in a programmer's best interest to try to avoid the unpredictable branches within any important sections of their code. The high-level description of the branch prediction unit is easy to grasp, but to quantify how much this may actually affect your performance, it helps to look at a concrete example with real performance numbers. So let's go back to our sample of finding the maximum in an array of 4,000 numbers. The source code implementation is shown here at the top. For our tiny and frequently called max routine, it's essential to apply the real return value optimization otherwise known as the inline keyword. So using that, this loop can now get compiled into one of two ways. Either with a branch instruction along with a comparison and an assignment, or with an assembly max instruction. The two assembly code versions are shown below. Using the max instruction, when we time this loop, each iteration takes three cycles, essentially the cost of that operation. And it doesn't matter what data you throw at it. With the branch version, on the left, the results differ depending on the ordering of the floating point numbers in this array. If we feed it a monotonic sequence, 
the branch version is actually faster since the CPU has already figured out that it should just always reject if a decreasing sequence or accept if we have an increasing sequence each two number it sees as it traverses the array. So now if we rearrange the numbers to generate the pathological worst unpredictable case then the performance drops by nearly a factor of five. The CPU simply can't get ahead of itself. So obviously it's best to avoid excessive misprediction in any sort of performance critical code. So what's interesting is that the randomly ordered sequence performs almost optimally. But wait a second, isn't random the very definition of unpredictable? Well actually not here. Simple statistical reasoning illustrates why. Sure, at first the running maximum will be updated often, but the frequency at which this happens will decrease rapidly as we traverse the array. At most, you know, at most of the 4,000 iterations, the current maximum is simply going to be left alone. So performance tuning involves understanding the hardware, as we've been, you know, reinforcing. But don't forget, it also helps to understand the nature of your application and possibly the data as well. The third major feature that we cover in greater detail is the mysterious out-of-order execution on the back end of the x86. To understand how processing works, we're going to take a look at three simple examples. Study this code for a moment. These three loops perform a multiply and an addition on some arrays of floating point data. The only difference is in the operands. Note that two of the mathematical expressions have a dependency on the previous iteration of the loop. When we time these loops, taking an average over a large number of iterations, there is a significant disparity in the results. It may even seem counterintuitive that the loop accessing the most data, i.e. the three separate arrays, that one will actually run the fastest. While these real-time results may not make sense, they are, in fact, very predictable. To understand why, we now need to dig deeper and take a look at how things are actually working. Your first suspect might be the compiler. However, all three code snippets generate essentially the same sequence of assembly code. The instructions here are simply load, multiply, add, store, and the usual for loop sequence. There's nothing here suggesting that there will be any performance difference between them. Next, let's take a look at Intel's reference manual to learn more about these instructions and see how long they should take. The table here on the right is the abridged version of the Intel processor reference manual. It is interesting to note that different instructions will take different amounts of time. However, our loops were all using the same instructions, which, according to this table, happen to be the rather fast ones too. But wait a second, there's two columns to this table. Well, there's latency, which is how long it takes an operation to complete, and there's another number labeled throughput, which says how frequently this instruction can be invoked. Given this throughput is lower than the latency, this implies I can have a number of instructions executing concurrently on a serial processor. Hmm, so how does this work? Well, we have to dig deeper into the back end of the x86. So when executed, an assembly instruction is broken down further into microops. Each microop does one and only one thing, such as a load, a store, or an arithmetic calculation. So a multiply assembly instruction where one operand happens to be a memory operand will be broken down into two microops, one to fetch the data and another to do the multiplication. Similarly, register operands from assembly instructions are actually like abstract variables and these get mapped on the fly to physical registers um, during this decoding process. So on the back end of the x86 are six specialized execution ports. Now there's some overlap in capabilities, but generally the math operations are split between port 0 and 1. There are two load ports, one for store, and port 5 for shuffling registers and a few other miscellaneous features. So the micro ops get di dispatched to the corresponding execution ports to be executed. Now each port can initiate one operation per cycle, and this is where the out-of-order action starts to happen. 
If the next UOP in the queue for any of these isn't ready because it's waiting for someone else, another UOP, to load some data or finish some calculation, well then another UOP that's behind that guy in the queue can begin execution. So although a new operation can begin every cycle, recall that an operation can take a number of cycles to complete, i.e. the latency, some more than others. So therefore, you know, you might already be starting to think that, hey, in order to saturate these execution ports with work, there have to be enough UOPs ready to go uh, so that, you know, we can keep these things busy at all times. So now, okay, let's refer now back to the assembly code from our SACSB SASB example and see how our code, our assembly code, gets broken up into micro ops. And we'll do this using the Intel Architecture Code Analyzer. This static analysis tool replaces the back of the napkin for determining how many micro-ops there are and which ports they get executed on. And the report's up here. So in addition to the table, this we also reports a potential throughput and an, an overall latency. Now this throughput value is the maximum of the number of UOPs on any one of the ports, and the latency is the sum of the instruction latencies along the critical data path. So notice here that we're reporting values of 2 and 14 respectively. Those numbers should look familiar. That's exactly the range we saw in our earlier results. The first loop depends on the previous iteration and takes about 14 cycles. Well, the next loop still has a dependency, but it's in the addition, and so the multiplication can kick off early. And that brings it down to about nine cycles on average. Finally, the last loop here has no data dependence, and the real-time performance is actually very close to the theoretical maximum throughput for the loop. Now, the instruction and data latencies within each iteration have not gone away, but they're effectively hidden. So when the x86 is executing this code, there are at least seven iterations active at any instant in time. Furthermore, we can even let the compiler unroll this loop once more to remove a couple of UOPs and save an extra half cycle on average, a notable difference on a two cycle loop. So the key to performance here is the absence of data dependence and keeping those execution ports saturated with work to do. So how can we take advantage of these concepts in practice? Well, we want to keep these execution ports saturated. So consider how you might write a routine to find the maximum element within an array. As we've already seen, you simply iterate over the array and update a running maximum each time you find a better answer. Not surprisingly, as we've already seen, this loop takes three cycles per iteration, and that matches the latency of the max instruction. So standard loop unrolling doesn't help here. It can't. The key observation is that we inherently serialize mathematical expressions whenever we convert them to C code. Clearly, finding a maximum doesn't depend on the iteration order. So rather than just keeping one running maximum, if we keep two and alternate, we end up doubling our performance, add another, and we have hidden the three cycle latency and reached the maximum throughput of the x86. Obviously, the final result, you know, we take the best of all the running maximums. Um, so in your own practice, you want to strive to reduce data dependencies, find these loops where you're not doing enough work and put more work in there, and then you'll be taking full advantage of the processing power available to you. And notice that writing assembly code isn't even necessary.